Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing space, space exploration, space commercialization, space research, and why it is important to us all with special guests, Carly Pittman, Executive Director of the Space Science Institute in Colorado, Anita Gale, CEO of the National Space Society in Washington, D.C., and Mark Sykes, CEO and Director of the Planetary Science Institute in Arizona. Thank you all for joining us. It's so wonderful to see to see you to talk about one of my very, very favorite topics. It brings me back to a little boy, to being a little boy and just so fascinated with everything that there is about space. So we're going to talk about this thing called space and how close it is because it's right there between my fingers, right? It's right in my body. And it's also an infinity beyond me, beyond my gaze. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, why this topic is so important, why your studies um, are, are so critical to our prosperity here on Earth and how we get more people engaged. Um, can we start with you, Carly? Um, could you talk a little bit about the Space Science Institute, what you do, what your mission is, and then let's broaden this out. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go over to Anita and then we'll end up with Mark. And then let's talk about the relevance of space because it's enormously expensive to explore. It's enormously expensive to commercialize. We're going to talk about what the return on that investment is for civil society. But let's start with, with the Space Science Institute, Carly. Tell us a little bit about your mission. Uh, yeah, so Space Science Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, both science research and education. Um, so our primary three-pronged mission here is to enable scientists to pursue the big discoveries in science. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by offering uh, the ability to work from anywhere so that you can be closer to your collaborations um, and just to give freedom and flexibility to those people working in science. Uh, we also uh, pursue uh, literacy, you know, science and STEM literacy for people of all ages and all backgrounds through our education programs that operate in all 50 states. And we also encourage people to pursue not only the educational, but career opportunities in yeah, all fields of STEM. <laughs> so you're basically trying to engage people and, and help them become uh, not only pursue their research today, but also become the future researchers to drive this field forward, right? Right. And Anita, uh, tell us a little bit about the National Space Society. The, uh, the National Space Society is a, a merger that happened in the 1980s of two organizations founded in the 1970s. One was the National Space Institute founded by Werner von Braun, and anyone interested in space should remember that name. And the other was the L5 Society, which was founded by Gerard O'Neill, Dr. Gerard O'Neill, who in the 1970s was very famous for developing a uh, space settlement design, living in space design um, that was uh, actually a NASA contract. Um, and and the, the L5 Society is named after a place in space where Dr. O'Neill thought that should be. He was very famous at the time. He was on the Johnny Carson show and cover of Playboy and all that sort of things. Um, the, uh, the organization is primarily an advocate organization advocating for living in space. Uh, we are finding, however, as we're getting close to the visions that NSS has been advocating for all these decades, finally, the real world is catching up to us. So we've been talking about infrastructure in space and living in space and com commercialization, industrialization, mining the moon for, for commodities that will be sold in space. Those things are starting to happen. So a, a lot of the uh, engineers and scientists who are working on those technologies are starting to join the National Space Society. And, uh, and it's a great way for the public to access through various programs that we have, uh, webinars and, and our conferences. The, the public can access, uh, access and, and literally rub shoulders with the engineering, engineers and scientists who are, who are doing it, who are making space economies happen. happen. It's, it's so interesting because space used to mean big government programs, and now we're seeing uh, big corporations getting involved, and you start seeing a supply chain that goes all the way down to smaller entities and, and the practicality of what we're doing whether it is um, getting uh, internet connections through satellites 
or GPS um, uh, communications through these, uh, these craft that are rotating through the earth, we're all benefiting uh, from this technology on a daily basis. Mark, could you talk a little bit about the Planetary Science Institute? And then let's, let's continue that discussion in terms of your work and how that informs uh, our, our, um, our experiences here on Earth and, and, and the practical application of some of your work. Uh, well, I'm the CEO of the Planetary Science Institute, and we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And uh, we support, uh, like a SSI, uh, a, a lot of scientists. We have over 115 PhDs living in 30 states and 10 countries. We're involved in basically all of the NASA solar system exploration missions, as well as missions uh, uh, in other countries. Uh, we study the solar system. We study s uh, solar systems around other stars. Uh, we study the sun and we study the earth because, you know, the earth is a planet. And... Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, yeah, we, so we do a lot of research and, and we're also dedicated to uh, getting, getting what we learn out to the, out to the public uh, uh, to inform them about uh, the universe they live in and the world they live on. And you're also studying the dynamics amongst the, the, the planet. So there's the, the physics of how these bodies actually interact and affect each other as well, correct? Well, it's, it's, it's not so much about, you know, Mars influencing Earth uh, or, or something like that, but rather, you know, the model, how we study these other worlds. You know, we use models that are often developed right here on the Earth to explain the Earth, like the global circulation uh, model. And, and we apply it to other other planets. And it's like uh, taking your, your family car out onto a racetrack and uh, taking it through through its paces and and finding out where it breaks. And 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 when we find that that things like the global circulation model uh, works very well in explaining what we observe on Mars. In fact, we can take it back in time, uh, uh, you know, millions of years and, and have predictions that, that, that come true based on, on that, the application of that model. Well, guess what? Doesn't that tell us that that model works pretty good on Earth? And so if it's telling us something about the climate change, that, that maybe we need to be l uh, listening to it? It's really interesting because there are studies that have taken place on, for example, the weather patterns of Jupiter and the, and, and the, uh, the dynamics in the atmosphere that I'm seeing applied now to climate models, in fact, to challenge some of the climate models that we've had here uh, historically. Um, do you find that, that the work that you're doing, Anita, that you're doing, Carly, and of course that you're doing, Mark, that... that the immediacy of application to real world problems here is becoming uh, shorter, that, that, that there's a closer relationship as we become much more familiar with the science and as we have computer modeling, uh, algorithmic um, modeling and so on and so forth that we can apply to different problems across boundaries that previously define those problems. So, so as an engineer who has been in the business since the mid 1970s, <laughs> it's always been there. Uh, it, either it's been on the horizon. I remember when, when GPS was first proposed. Well, and now it's everywhere. I think a lot of people don't even realize that GPS is a satellite system. It's not just something that tells you where you are. It tells you where you are because there are satellites in orbit above it above us. So for, for an engineer, it's, it's just, yeah, we're just doing what we do. And space happens to be part of it. Well, what you're, what you're saying is that that actually these ideas, which used to be um, the um, the uh, prov uh, province of of academics, scientists, researchers, specialists, are now becoming uh, more commonly discussed and also more commonly experienced through these kinds of uh, yes, yeah. Right? And there's a, a satellite, the Landsat system, has been in operation for decades and decades, doing Earth observations. We're just doing more Earth observations and better Earth observations now in different sensors. It's, so it's, it's, it's a continuum. It's improving over time. How do we get the knowledge distributed? Um, are, are, are each of your organizations, Carly, you described your organization as being very much engaged in getting knowledge out there and also uh, fostering knowledge. Uh, Mark, are you, are you uh, trying to get more and more people engaged in this beyond the specialists uh, the PhDs and so on who are intimately attached. Are you? Are, do you have programs to get more people involved? Sure, we all. I, 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 Carly, Carly's well. We, you know, we we put out 
uh, when, when papers are published and things like that, we put out press releases. And nowadays we also put out social media stuff and, and, uh, uh we have people giving lectures. We have, uh, uh, programs that go into uh, classrooms, but we, we try to engage the public, uh, uh, along a greater and greater number of vectors as, as you know, the technology is developed to do so. What do you think is the most important uh, thing that the public should be supporting today before it was an easy question to answer, right? Well, space exploration, right? But now we have major projects. Um, the, the new telescope that was, uh, was launched that is um, really going to provide um, a lot of data, but for real specialists. And then we have this this amazing array of satellites that Elon Musk is is uh, is putting up um, that is going to improve communications. That's a very practical commercial application. And then in between that is the is these um, these flights by billionaires, you know, launching rockets that go up and come down, right? Um, and, and taking these different uh, modalities. I'm, I'm going to go around the room and starting with you, Carly. What do you think is the most important thing that we should think about? as sort of just plain citizens in terms of space and where we think we should invest our time, effort, money, um, attention? The labor force, because you get all the wonderful ideas and anything that we work on in space, you've got to have people to analyze it and tell you what you need. And you know, right now, there's a lot of emphasis with uh, machine learning, um, which can be a great tool, but don't just assume that the computers are going to do this. You need to, you know, support the people that do this for a living. So it's kids, it's it's adolescents, it's adults, it's 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 everyone, right? It's basically we're getting back down to people, right, Carly? Back down to people. Yep, we're nonprofits, people. <laughs> Um, Mark, you made a point before the show started about the whole education system and how we need to change. Uh, could you just uh, do you mind reprising the point that that we made about your own experiences? Well, you know, we're we're it's important for us to to increase the diversity of of our profession and 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 actually, the, I would say the United States is is in a great position in in that we probably have a more diverse population than any place else but historically uh big chunks like the african american community uh, uh has been has been blocked from uh participating in in what we do i mean it's it's nice to go out there and encourage hey look what we're doing it's exciting don't you want to join us and and, and you know but people you don't people don't have the uh, the educational resources, the economic resources, uh, uh, because they've been excluded, not because they that they haven't been interested. Uh, I think back to uh, the late 50s, uh, the Sputnik scare and uh, uh, the, the Defense Authorization Act that poured all kinds of money into science and math education in this country. I've been it from that uh, as, a, as a young child uh, uh, in the 60s. <clears throat> and um, uh, but uh, things were done in a way to exclude those resources from black schools. And, 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 and this is a, this isn't, we're not talking about things that just, Oh, this happened in the misty past and all that. This kind of stuff goes on today. And, and of course it, now it's being normalized uh, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, various political uh, venues. So, so that's, that's an important thing that we need to address. And we need this diversity because when you have a group of people, you know, science is not just about doing the math and you know the equation and here's the answer and, and all that kind of stuff. Talk boards and so we, we on. Look, we look at things out there and go, well, what's going on with that? And, and where we get our ideas to begin the process of, of answering questions comes from our various, you know, backgrounds. And sometimes those ideas might be inspired by a religious thought or some, a paper you read or a meal you cooked or, or whatever. And when you have a room full of people that just look like me, the diversity of, of that imagination to apply to these problems is pretty narrow. And, uh, uh, and, 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 that, and, and so the extent that we can make that as, as broad as possible will give us the healthiest science, the best, the best science and, 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 you know, generate more knowledge uh, as a consequence, which will be economically beneficial and, and just generally a good thing. And, and so, but we can't just say, Hey, look at us. We're interesting. 
uh, it, it's we, we got to look at at giving people a uh, putting people more on a, a level playing field, but recognizing that that uh, they have been excluded from that field. They've been, they've been with deliberateness excluded uh, from the economic and educational opportunities that I've been ad- benefited from over my life. And Anita, you also told the story. Could you could you relate your your uh, experience? Well, actually, uh, I'd, I'd first like to add um, a little bit to, to this discussion. I go to a lot of places around the United States where I hear from city leaders and school district leaders in this area. It always starts in this area. Students have, don't have an idea of the, the opportunities available to them. Um, so part of what we need to do, and there, the National Space Society has tools to do this. We just I would love to do some uh, engineering activities with every kid in the country. <laughs> Find me. We'll help you help you do that. Also, something people don't realize is that money spent on space projects is all spent here on the ground. It's not the money, money, not yet. Money isn't yet spent on space until we start making lunar commodities that we sell to people in space. But money is all spent here on Earth. It's the, the money spent on space projects is not taken away from the economy of Earth. It's adding to the economy of Earth. My, my own uh, the, the, talking to the, the exclusion that Mark talked about. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1969. I didn't even tell my high school counselors I wanted to go into engineering. When I was in engineering uh, between 1969 and 1974, I got both a bachelor's and master's in five years, uh, engineering enrollment of women passed 1%. So I get into industry and the the engineering population of women is 0.00, nothing. So I was first woman, only woman, most vintage woman of almost everything I've ever done in my career. Yeah, and and so what what that means is that we're leaving talent behind, right? We're leaving ideas behind. Mark's point that you know who knows where the next idea comes from, and if what we're doing is we're systematically deciding that only a very few people, because of our policies, can have access to this this path, what we're doing is we're hobbling ourselves. Carly, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you are shifting that reality by engaging others, by investing? And by having uh, your your donors, your board members, your funders um, undertake that investment, uh, talk a little bit about some of your programs. Uh, so, a lot of our programs, since we have the charge to increase the STEM literacy for people of all ages, we go for pre-K through gray audiences and families. Um, we have um, education programs that focus on the broader social issues uh, in line with our mission, such as gender and racial equity making sure that we create and distribute bilingual resources and activities for Spanish speaking families, for example, Um, making sure that our websites are accessible to disabled people, you know, co-creating content with native tribes uh, in a a lot of work with Bridget, the digital divide in both rural and urban underserved communities. So there's kind of that general thing. I'm also co-chair of the American Astronomical Society's Committee for the Status of Women in Astronomy right now, which is pursuing the practical measures to help improve opportunities for women in astronomy and to encourage their entry into this field. And that partners with a broader group of affinity communities that advocate for minority LGBTQ plus and disabled astronomers. So you know, there's a lot of ways we're working on this. <laughs> See, I love I love that because so often we define the sector in these little buckets, these little pigeonholes, right? The whole idea that that um, thinking about uh, uh, making things accessible to people with disability, because that's where the genius might be, making things accessible to people who are young. What, what did you say to gray? Yeah, pre K to gray, <laughs> right? Pre K to, to gray, right? Youth and age become equivalent when we're talking about creativity, right? So how do you, how do you create that, that, that opportunity is, cannot be divorced from the actual subject matter uh, that we're talking about? Um, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the future of this area and where we see this, this actually migrating to, to this world. Um, it seems to me that that space is becoming increasingly another 
um, area of competition, and we've moved beyond the ideological phase to a very practical uh, circumstance in which um, space junk, I talked about Elon Musk's um, web of satellites, but they're all, we also have the fact that we're putting a lot of junk up in space and, and that junk is becoming hazardous. So we're talking about regulation there. We're talking about um, arms um, uh, competition with exploding satellites uh, that are positioned to, to, to attack other satellites. Um, we're talking about um, uh, claiming areas uh, of the moon or of, of, other, uh, of other planets. Mark, could you talk a little bit about what you see in the future and how we can foresaw some of these negative impacts? Of I don't think we I don't think we can because we, we have a lot of uh, uh, stupid people in the world. And uh, when you blow up satellites, you know, there's this thing called celestial mechanics and that debris, you know, uh, uh, forms a ring and then forms a torus and runs into things. Uh, you know, that kind of activity uh, goes on and, and uh, is, is this going to ultimately make uh, uh, near Earth space, a, a, a place where we can't do anything, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, AKA, sort of the other stuff you're talking about, uh, you know, what the future is. Uh, well, you know, it's the space has been commercialized for a long time. You know, communications is a, a very big deal. Uh, uh, Earth observing is a very big deal, you know, because it affects uh, uh, agriculture and aquaculture and, and, and uh, even looking for resources on the Earth, you know, for mining and, and stuff like that. A lot of that is, is leveraged and facilitated, you know, by, by work in space. In terms of what, what, whether we have a future uh, in space beyond uh, performance art, uh, you know, that's, that's yet to be seen. Uh, because, you know, we have the Artemis program to go back to the moon and, and all that. I mean, I, I, I was involved with the Space Exploration Initiative, which you need to remember, uh, you know, back to the moon, this time to stay, then on to Mars. And, uh, uh, you know, look what happened with that. Uh, uh, I've been involved with every initiative since then, and, and look what happened to that. Uh, even the Artemis program today, there is no commitment beyond one landing. There's, there's, there's no plan for permanent... Uh, 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 habitation or whatever uh, uh, facility be on the moon. If there was a plan, then there'd be it really interesting flow down requirements that would be really fun to, to address. Uh, you know, the value of doing something like that. Well, let's look at something like a close, just a close ecology life support systems, you know, that, that it's one thing to do things in an experiment. That's, that's a experiment on the earth in a, in a cannon in Florida or something. But, but we, we, Sorry. we, when you're in a situation uh, where, where if you don't figure it out or if you, you know, then people can die. Well, you know, then you dig into it deeper. And then that helps l learn a lot about, again, isolating ourselves from the environment down here in the earth. So, so the, right now, I'd say our future in space is, is what we can make for money. So the, the space tourism, that's all, that's all great. Uh, but they're not doing it for, for uh, uh, oh, you, you know, existential, uh, uh, wonderful things. They're doing it to make money. They, they do it because they can make money. And that's fine. I'm, 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 all, I'm all for that. Uh, 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 but, but in terms of the rest of it, uh, you know, it's, it's to the extent that we just go down to plant a flag, you know, or to say, well, we did it. So we're, you know, have more testosterone in our system. Well, that's performance art. And, and at some point, uh, I think that we risk uh, coming to an end on, on, on all that stuff when we don't have a long-term vision. Like Nina, to we're going to go to you. Yeah, I'd like to add something. There's an experiment going on on the International Space Station right now that's taking advantage of microgravity or basically almost zero gravity to grow human retina tissue, your eyes, human retina tissue in zero gravity. And they're getting retina tissue that could be implanted in people's eyes and prevent people from being blind. That's worth a lot. That is a product that can come from space. So we're doing research right now. Uh, on the moon, we've, we've landed in six places on the front side, which is basically basalt plains, lava plains. On the back side, the, the highlands are primordial bedrock that have been pummeled by, for, by, for four billion years by everything the universe can throw at it. So whereas there's a mine in Sudbury, Canada that's been producing since the 1880s that turned out to be an asteroid strike, there are lots of those on the backside of the moon. We need to get back there. And we found that, yeah, we, yeah. we have found that zero gravity is a great resource. 
we can get better vacuum in space or, or on the, the lunar surface than we can get with very expensive equipment here on, on Earth. That's a, a valuable production commodity. There is so much economic potential in space and on the moon. We just need to get there. <laughs> We, we've had a couple of, uh, of uh, polls. The first poll was about uh, what, is it, what is the greatest benefit? And the uh, two answers that received the most uh, answers were basically knowledge for its own sake um, and knowledge and specific knowledge pertaining to the physics, chemistry, uh, uh, material sciences um, that, that can benefit um, uh, people on earth. But those were the two biggest issues. It was not about um, uh, space tourism or uh, shooting rockets up or, or wars or any of that stuff. It was, it was really about knowledge. Um, Carly, um, can you talk a little bit about where you see the future uh, going in terms of the use of space? Is, it, is, it, is the potential really, as Anita talks about, that we basically integrate it into our daily economic activity. Space is just part of living. It's, it's an extension of what we do. And, um, you know, maybe we work in space, maybe we create things in space. It's just another venue for human activity. I would love for that to be the case. Uh, I think we're still in resource prospecting mode right now. And, you know, obviously uh, concerns about protections from the threat from near earth asteroids or, you know, military security and space types of things. Um, but you know, I, we're still in that resource prospecting phase as far as I can see for several decades. <laughs> Do you think that the, uh, we just had- Don't this, look up. Yeah, <laughs> the, we just had, and Mark, I'm gonna give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. Uh -oh. um, we just had this, this film um, uh, that was uh, Don't Look Up, right? Where um, the, the scientists were, uh, it, it's so interesting. Evidence, scientists, like data, um, was basically ignored for, for fantasy until it's too late. Right. Um, and and we're, we're all talking about the possibilities of space, but also uh, some of the downsides, putting a lot of junk up in space, creating a venue for wars and so on and so forth. Is there something that we can do in terms of society, society and how we actually pay attention to evidence and uh, expertise. Well, you got to present evidence because when we talk on TV, when I when I talk on the news or, or do an interview for the paper, what appears on the news or in the paper is a conclusory soundbite statement, and and no 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 time or, or space is given to explaining the process by which things come about. It relies on my making a conclusory statement because I've got a white beard and maybe a lab coat and have a PhD and, and have some status that people should listen to me. And so science has been reduced to, uh, uh, and it's, and, and science is, I don't think science is being really taught as a process. And so the public is looking at science as just another opinion that if you don't like that opinion, then you can ignore it. So and it's the soundbite against another soundbite, right, Anita? Right, right, right. Soundbites. We've, we've, yeah. we've, got, we've got to find some way of spending time, our own little special uh, uh, cable channel or something like that. So if one says, so if somebody says this, this vaccine is 97% effective, well, let's have let's have a half hour presentation about, well, we started out with this many people. We gave these many people the vaccine after such and such a period of time. This many people had the disease in these two groups. And then we do the ratio. We do arithmetic here and, you know, explain about how the how the science works. Explain what uncertainty means, uh, 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 because people go, oh, there's uncertainty. Well, then we can like in the movie, you know, oh, it's it's ninety nine point seven. It's not 100 percent. And so we can ignore it, you know, uh, uh uh, we do a terrible job uh, presenting science today, and I'd say it's it's even worse uh, th than it was uh, when I was much younger. When it was there's a lot of novelty, particularly in our business, and so there's a lot more uh, ex explanat explanatory uh, stuff uh, provided in the media, and that's gone now. Uh, Anita, um, Carly, I'm going to give. Uh, we're going to go one more round. Anita, could you comment on on that? How do we how do we deal with that? How do we how do we change this? Do we have to become better communicators? Well, yeah, there's been discussion in the engineering nonprofit community um, 
engineering technical societies and, and NSS, um, it, it, there has not been a good TV show about engineers at work and what engineers do. I mean, we have TV shows about police officers and medical people and lawyers, but not about engineers. People don't know what engineers do. You look around the room and people don't know that everything in your room was touched by engineers in some way, which means engineering is a really great career. Path. Except for hidden, hidden figures it would be one of them. They're very, very few, but there are some, and even there, um, uh, um, it was it was really about the drama surrounding uh, surrounding uh, those individuals, but but the whole idea of of trying to figure out how problems are solved, like a police procedural, but now applied to um, to engineering. I, I think you have something there. The whole idea of we need to make things accessible, and maybe partly it's our fault by not making things accessible. Is is that part of your point, uh, Anita, or not? Well, yeah, yes, yeah, uh, people hear the word engineer and they either think driving a train, <laughs> uh, which is a different kind of engineer, or, or it's these lofty people in, in white shirts and ties. And, and that's how it was in the 60s, for sure. But I, there are exciting things in engineering. I, I worked proposals. I worked on space shuttle program. Um, I actually I just saw a launch of a Falcon 9 yesterday. I'm, I'm actually at Kennedy Space Center right now. Um, they're, they're, people see the results of what engineers do, but don't understand that there is a very exciting process to get there. There are trade studies and decisions and conflict, and we argue with each other, and then we resolve it. And, and there's no one, one, only one best solution. There's, there are many ways to get to a solution that's really great. And, and sometimes we goof up, and, and a lot of times we do really spectacular stuff. Um, in my career, I've had a lot of disappointments. There are vehicles that should be flying today that aren't. Damn it. Damn, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I grew up in the state of Washington with a lot of dams on the Columbia River. So <laughs> three letters. <laughs> so maybe we need to get out of our lab coats, put on a, a, a colorful bow, bow tie and have a television show like Bill Nye does. Uh, maybe we have to create little TikTok videos or YouTube videos on how we create solutions. Um, Carly, take us out. Uh, what uh, are you doing to, to help us all understand the wonderful, exciting world of the engineering that is being done so we can explore space? Well, there are many things there. First, I want to say that there is a distinction nowadays between education and communication of science in terms of how we are funded to interact with the public. So scientists and engineers are kind of kept at a bit of a distance from the public. Um, it's, so you have educators running the show with the scientists and engineers as featured subject matter experts. So your content is pre-filtered to some degree in there and the messaging is a bit more controlled. So, you know, an individual scientist putting on the bow tie, it, it's getting more rare. Uh, there are, that being said, there are special trainings offered for scientists and engineers who want to speak to the public or to the press or to politicians. So it, it's not that you know, these resources don't exist. It's just a little more nuanced communication than what you might think. Um, a lot of ways we do this uh, would be uh, we have traveling exhibits that go to public libraries. So you know, we'll have featured guests or someone from the ISS space station or you know, live links so that we can connect um, you know, and train the trainers is more of the model instead of being the sage on the stage. So. Getting people involved, getting people involved in the everyday work that you do. Carly Pittman, Executive Director of the Space Science Institute in Colorado. Anita Gale, CEO of the National Space Society. And Mark Sykes, CEO and Director of the Planetary Science Institute. Thank you all so much for sharing the, the work that you're doing. Thank your boards. Thank your staffs. Um, and, and really, it's just been wonderful to, to share uh, some information on space with you. Have a great day. Everyone stay safe. Attendees, thank you so much for your questions. Thank we'll you. See you on Thursday. Thank Take you. Care.